Hello and welcome to Speak Life. I'm joined today by Catherine Butcher, who is the uh, co-author of The Servant Queen and The King She Serves and uh, a new book called Our Faithful Queen. Uh, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. Now, uh, alongside being the author of these wonderful books, you are also a member of The Q. Uh, In- a Indeed. Cue, a queue that will be spoken of for decades to come. Indeed. Yeah. When, when did you line up to, to see the Queen lying in state? I joined the queue hmm. at 8.20 in the evening on the first day that it was op- uh, uh, possible. So uh, the lying in state became open to the public at five o'clock and I was in the queue by 20 past eight. Okay. And at that stage, how far back from Westminster Hall were you? It was London Bridge, about two and a half miles from uh, Westminster Hall. Okay, and and since that point, the the queue has sort of extended far beyond sort of three, four miles. Has, has it been? Oh, as, it's, as it's gone beyond that now. I right. think they have capacity for ten miles, and wow. they closed it this morning because it was already a six-hour wait. My goodness! So from London Bridge, two and a half miles. How long did it take you to get to the front? Eight hours. Eight hours. But in that time, we had one, about an hour when we couldn't move at all because they had to clean Westminster Hall about two o'clock in the morning. And apparently one of the guards of honour collapsed. And so they had to deal with that. So we were probably waiting for seven hours, moving for seven hours and standing still for at least an hour. During the wee small hours of the night. Absolutely. What's the atmosphere in the queue like? Very Patient, and <laughs> we talked a lot about the queue. We mm. talked about how long is the queue, how fast is the queue moving, what is queue etiquette, <laughs> why is that person jumping the queue? Ah, uh, yes. Did that happen? I'm afraid it did, yes. but not with many. It was mm-hmm. the rare person who just sidled along, and you suddenly realised that when we got to the zigzag bit outside Westminster Hall, they were several zigzags in front of where they should have been. Right. Okay. And were there any people sort of holding places in the queue for others who sort of came? People were very gracious. If you disappeared off to use the facilities or to buy a coffee, then they kept your place. And okay. there were lovely ushers. We were so well looked after. It was brilliantly organised. And the the scouts had come from all over the country. I spoke to one from Wales and another one from Scotland. And they had come to help encourage people. So by three o'clock in the morning, a scout was telling me, keep your spirits up and uh, and also <laughs> holding, helping people to find their place back in the queue if they'd lost their place. Did things get progressively more sombre or serious as you got towards the front? Only once we mem- actually entered the precincts of, mm. of Parliament. Up until then, we shared cheese and biscuits at half past two we got to know each other almost inside leg measurement it was so (laughs) (laughs) we really got to know people because you were with people around you for eight hours so you'd never met but you got to know each other's stories and because I'm a journalist I always ask questions so I was asking them what was their memory of the queen and Mm -hmm. why had they joined the queue and I was able to share some of the stories that I have yeah and you have many stories which we'll kind of press into here Um, were you prepared for what it was you were going to do once you because I guess you joined the queue when you hadn't seen anyone online actually see the Queen lying in state and so Correct, you, yes. you, you you hadn't been formed by any of that no. what were you expecting to see what were you expecting yourself to do once you were in her presence well I'd watched people in St Giles Cathedral and mm. had seen how some just walked straight past as if they were out on a country walk I wanted, to, I wanted to be there because I write a lot about the Queen and it's a bit distant and I wanted to be connected to a real event mm. and to give my own um, tribute to mm. the Queen. And so I was expecting the silence because there is silence. You walk in and you're at the, st- the top of the steps in Westminster Hall, which is a huge cavernous space full of rich history. And the Queen's own father was... Uh, lying in state there. We've seen many pictures from there. And so I knew that what the space would be like and they had a new carpet rolled down on the steps and we we walked down slowly and everyone was silent. Mm. And for me, I was struck how small the crown was on top of the, the coffin. Mm. I'd seen lots of pictures of that, the, the imperial state crown, and it's sparkling, and it was sparkling uh, with its millions, or it's not millions, but, but hundreds of diamonds. 
but it seemed small and the orb seemed enormous hmm. and prominently on top of them both a cross mm. and that deep symbolism that the cross is more important than anything in the world because the cross is over a globe and then the person who wears the crown is under the authority of Jesus Christ who died on the cross and so that was significant and then also the right in front of the coffin at the queen's feet there is another cross with latin inscription on it a large ceremonial cross and the latin speaks of when swords will be beaten into plowshares and that speaks of heaven and so i i'm grateful that the queen knew where she was going and that was an empty box in mm. some ways it's a body right right uh, because the queen had spoken of resurrection and I believe that that's what's happened to her. Right. Today you will be with me in paradise, said Jesus to the thief on the cross. Yes. And so I trust that she's already in, in the presence of the King of Kings. Yes. I've been very conflicted when I've heard journalists refer to, and the Queen will be traveling from here to here, and the Queen will be doing this as if the sum total of the Queen is sort of exhausted by what lies within that box. And I think in former mm -hmm. times we might have spoken of the, the earthly remains of the Queen. Uh, and yet she had that hope and we have that hope of, of today you'll be with me in paradise. Um, but we are in this strange time between her death and her yes, burial. And yes. people still refer to the person as somewhat present with us until mm -hmm. that uh uh, till the burial. So I, I can understand it, but yes, yes. Um, yeah. she's with her Lord. And in many other cultures, there would be a sort of a lying in state, sometimes with an open casket. And in so many cultures, um, those who have, dis have, have died are on display. They're, they're laid out down on the dining table downstairs. And people are, I guess, confronted by the reality of death in, in a way that we're, we're kind of shielded from in modern 21st century Britain. Do you, do you think our modern, going, going through these 10 days of mourning, do you think it might be doing us some good in terms of pressing into our own mortality? Certainly. It's something that we have to come to terms with. We all die. Mm. And I think the Queen had a, she had a great life, a really good life, mm. a life well lived. But she also had a good death mm. because she's someone who approached death with... Um, an appreciation of her own mortality. There's a lovely story that the Archbishop of Canterbury told us. When she was last at General Synod in person, that's the she's the Supreme Governor of the Church of England and the the governing body, the Synod, she attended that and they sang God save our gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen. And as she left the stage, she turned to the Archbishop and said quietly, I think I've lived long enough, don't you? <laughs> and he didn't reply because that would have been treason to have agreed that the Queen should <laughs> <That's> die. <true. laughs> but it just shows that here's someone who's really comfortable with their own mortality. And that was seven years before her death. Mm. And then in the as her her if human faculties became less she was someone who made her wishes known she had made sort of set her affairs in order mm. she said that she wanted camilla to be known as queen consort she said that she wanted uh, her son to be the head of the commonwealth she began to withdraw from being physically present at events i was very disappointed about that because i was outside all uh, St. Paul's Cathedral when she was due to be there for the Platinum Jubilee Thanksgiving service. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a commentary and she didn't come. Ah. However, uh, it's nothing to do with me. It's all <laughs> about her and, and her saviour, really. Yeah. And I, I guess she held on for the resignation of Boris Johnson. She had an audience with Liz Truss. And within two days of that, I guess, she was, she was with her saviour. And it always strikes me that we have relatives in our families who hold on for that last Christmas or they hold on for the family wedding. And she held on to do her duty, to, to oversee the 14th um, 15th. Well, but the 14th transfer of power, you know, to, to, the, to the 15th, you know, Prime Minister, mm -hmm. Liz Truss. And, and doing her duty is, is really something that, that kind of marks her, her entire reign, would you say? Absolutely. And right at the beginning of her reign, she said, I will, till my dying day, yeah. will uh, 
will be your servant. And yes. and she did, didn't she? Within yes. 48 hours of her last duty, she died. Yes, yeah. And I guess that was kind of the, the theme of this book that you wrote together with uh, Mark Green. How long ago was the, did The Servant Queen come out? That was 2016, on the Queen's 90th birthday. On the Queen's 90th birthday. The Servant Queen and the King She Serves, which is just the perfect title. And uh, and it says here, with a foreword by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, she wasn't in the habit of writing forewords, I don't think. This is the only foreword she ever wrote. So Robert Lacey, her biography's men- biographer, has mentioned this a few times on television. I think he's a bit jealous. <laughs> but, <laughs> I think the reason she did it because is because we described her as a servant queen in mm-hmm. the context of her faith. Because her faith was something that was almost hidden in plain sight. For the person who's looking for it, every speech that she wrote herself, that's the Christmas broadcasts, she talked about Jesus. She pointed, and I've been through them all. I've been through the, there were a couple of years when she didn't actually give a Christmas broadcast, but they all point back to Jesus' birth in Bethlehem because that's what Christmas is about. So Mm. she anchored Christmas as a faith, a celebration of faith. And probably since the millennium, turned of the millennium she's talked very clearly about Jesus not as a part of an institution she's not talked about church as being something important to her but Jesus as being her inspiration Jesus as being the bedrock of her faith so I think we want we wanted to reflect that so that the what was hidden became revealed because lots of people were talking about her hats and her corgis and her horses (laughs) and all those sorts of things. But people seem to forget that Sunday mornings, the Queen was in worship with other people. Right, right. Uh, And and she would, I I guess the the angle that you go with here is the, the angle of service as something that's kind of distinctly Christian and and she would you know she would sign off from letters your servant Elizabeth R uh, rather than your queen Elizabeth R well that was certainly the recent one the platinum jubilee uh, statement to to all of us mm. she signed off as your servant Elizabeth mm. and i think that that's how she th- she saw herself and she talked about Jesus as someone who uh, gave himself to us as someone who who sought to make of himself nothing and to become a servant for all. Mm. And she talked about Jesus as her role model, and she sought to do that, mm. to become a servant. And there are, there are stories that have come out since her death of how she served other people. There's a lovely story about Terry Waite. Terry Waite had been incarcerated in solitary confinement for five years. When he, anybody came into his cell, he had to wear a blindfold. He'd seen no one, he talked to no one. He didn't even have a toothbrush. And the poor man was set free to the, the limelight of publicity. And the Queen invited him to stay with his family in private at Balmoral. They arrived, there was a full fridge. They'd been taken there by helicopter. Mm -hmm. They were given Mm -hmm. a Land Rover to use and told, if there's anything you need, you can have people come to to make your meals for you. But they decided that they would just uh, spend time together as a family. But they did have some weekend lunches with, with the royal family. So there's an example of someone who who sought to put faith into practice, serving other people on an individual basis, in private, as well as in the public arena where she served for so long. Mm. And I think that made, for so many people, um, monarchy and royalty believable, because it was clear in Elizabeth that it was a it was a servant-hearted rule. I asked a friend recently, do you believe in monarchy? He said, well, I believe in Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he sort of speaks for a lot of people mm. um, because when you, when you see Elizabeth, you know, I guess age 10, she became the, the, the princess royal. She, she became heir to the throne at age 10. And then age 25, she's, she's crowned. And I guess we've all had the sense that she hasn't so much been thrust on us as the crown has been thrust on her. Mm. <laughs> and... She has served in that, and I guess that makes that makes the rule of a monarch believable because I guess it's a Christ-like rule, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is, and we did see that transition. Uh, someone who probably would have been very happy to be a country gentlewoman mm. looking after horses and her family and not really seeing much of the, the limelight, and yet 
she chose to accept the role that was thrust upon her, as you say, and and did it so remarkably well with no... I mean, journalists get to see behind the, behind the scenes and there were no examples of of scandal, crosswords. Mm. Here was someone who everyone has talked of as, as gracious, who made them feel like they were the only person in the room. Mm. And they estimate that a third of the population in the United Kingdom has met her or has been close to her. Mm. And yes, she saw people from all around the world and and glamorous celebrities but actually she met ordinary people in their workplace mm. and she went to hospitals and she opened factories and met the staff she was comfortable under the bonnet of a an engine <laughs> uh, from her uh, days in service in the war but was also comfortable washing up after a picnic at Balmoral. Mm. Lots has been said uh, about um colonialism lots has been said about empire and and the sins of empire in britain's past um it strikes me though that since 1953 we've had an extraordinary period of decolonization um in that time and we've gone from an imperial family to a commonwealth of nations what what does that say about us and what does that say about her well we have lost our empire in some ways in many ways well we've lost our empire completely <laughs> But the Queen has sought to bring reconciliation between people, and how Christ-like is that, to in encourage people to become a friendly group of nations, 56 countries who are all seen as equal. And so when the Commonwealth Games take place, she praises other countries as well as the UK for their part in those games, because she's excited about the successes of everyone. And I think the Queen's ability to bring people together has been seen in in how the commonwealth has strengthened rather than weakened as the mm. empire has disappeared mm. and i wonder where she got that vision from mm -hmm. perhaps it was revelation when mm. every nation will be joined together mm. to bow down before the king of kings and perhaps that was her inspiration because where else do you find out about her a group of countries coming together in such a way. Mm, yeah, yeah, a fascinating vision that, that, that tribes are a thing in the Bible. Um, tribalism is bad, tribes are a thing, but blending and uniting, um, br bringing community and unity to those tribes mm. in, a, in a common worship um, is, a, is a fascinating tapestry in the Bible. Uh, you have not only written, uh, co-written The Servant Queen and The King She Serves, uh, you've also uh, authored this work, Our Faithful Queen, 70 Years of Faith and Service. Uh, what was the inspiration behind this? Well, when we were working on the, on the first book, I came across a little book of private devotions that was written by the Archbishop of Canterbury to prepare the Queen for her coronation. And devotions are something that Christians use mm. on a regular basis with Bible readings and prayers and uh, devotional thoughts, things to make people think of what, to think on deeper themes. So the little book of private devotions is a small black leather bound book and it helped the Queen prepare by focusing in on some of the significant aspects. Right at the beginning, the book talks about how the Queen's all of life is a journey to God and the Queen talked about how she would come to God in obedience and because God was leading her, then she could follow in complete trust. Mm. And then the book talks about the most important symbolism in the coronation, not the crowning, not the enthroning, mm -hmm. but the anointing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so at that point in the ceremony, she took off the jewels, she took off the, the rich robe and was wearing a simple white dress. Mm. And at that point, she was coming to God, as the book describes, in her own person, not because she was royal, but because she was a follower of Jesus mm. and she was anointed. Mm. And any Christian can be anointed by God, mm. anointed by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit helps us to live our lives as followers of Jesus and reminds us of the mm. things that Jesus says. Mm. And that's what she, what was the most significant part. It was so significant that it was hidden from view. So right. people don't notice it because they see the, the processions and the other um, television, rem the other ways that television reminds us of the coronation, but it, you don't see that bit. Yes. 
Yes. Have you come across, this, this week I, I came across a C.S. Lewis quote um, from 1953 where he writes to an American correspondent about the coronation and the American was um, very taken by the fairy tale aspect of it. And Lewis says, um, no, what struck us here was the humanity of it, that, that that large heavy crown was pressed onto such a small head. And it, and it seemed to speak to Lewis, certainly, of humanity being crowned as, like, in Adam we are vice regents and high priests of, of, of the earth, and that her situation was kind of our situation. And I thought that was quite interesting, that, that sort of an, uh, an American looking on sees about the distance in the one who is crowned. But actually, Lewis, through some very Christian spectacles, is saying there's something very human. She is us. She is a frail human who is given dominion. Well, guess what? You know, humanity are frail humans being dominion, uh, having dominion. And it, it strikes me that actually having a royal family and having uh, a person who is sovereign, who in, kind of embodies the realm, it's, she's not therefore more distant from us because of that. But she's actually, she's, she actually represents us all the more, such that you know, royal families and royal weddings and royal births and royal deaths are personal in, in a way that simply having a, a sort of a state apparatus, simply having a constitution is not. It's, it's, it's kind of a personal thing. And I, I, I wonder, therefore, as we come to 70 years of the Eliz- Elizabethan age having passed, that's, that's a personal loss to to the nation to the commonwealth do you, some some think that the these 10 days have been overblown but for me i i think these 10 days are recognizing that the death of the queen is is a public loss and and it's a very personal loss would you say yes indeed it is a very personal loss for so many people mm. and i think the queen acted out some of what it is to be to be part of the kingdom of priests and holy nation that the Bible talks about. And so, yes, we are all entitled to be kings and queens in the presence of God because we are brothers and sisters with Jesus. And we are promised a a crown, a crown of righteousness that is because of Jesus. He's the one who's righteous and we're the ones who are entitled to wear a crown that is so undeserved. Mm. And so the queen coming as she did so much of the ceremony is is about uh, becoming a priest it's very mm. similar to priesting yes and a lot of people don't realize the coronation took place in a communion service in a church right. and people forget that perhaps in mm. all the pageantry this is a normal communion service when she walked in the first thing she did was to kneel down at the altar and the last thing that will happen in her life the crown well it's not in her life her life has gone the last piece of ceremony will be that the crown the scepter and the orb will be removed from the coffin and placed on the altar in St George's Chapel right. because it's God who gave and God who has taken away blessed be the name of the Lord as it goes mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and the queen is someone who acted out for many of us what it is to approach the throne of God mm-hmm. and it resonates with me so much because I I love the pictures Jesus tells about heaven, about heaven being like a wedding, heaven being like a victory parade, heaven being uh, like a garden, all these different images that Jesus gave us um, of, of heaven. And I think the coronation ceremony resonates with so much of us, so many of us, is because there's something in our a spiritual DNA that says we are made to approach the King of Kings. Okay. We are made to be crowned. We are made to walk with the power of God in us. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Queen showed us what that can be like. And so in her death, death is an affront to all of us. Mm-hmm. Death was not intended. In the Garden of Eden, there was not an in- God didn't intend people to die, but our sin separates us from God. And so death is an affront. Mm. (laughs) And yet we can be confident that death has been overcome because of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I've perhaps 
veered away a little bit from mm. from what uh, the Queen does, but those are things that she believed yeah. and she talked about in her speeches. Yeah, yeah. And t- tell me some stories about uh, these books. Um, obviously, the, the Servant Queen has been out for, for a lot longer, for the last sort of six years. I mean, this has... You've, you've printed how many of these copies? Do you keep 1.3 million copies of the Servant Queen have wow. been distributed. And because we wanted as many people as possible to read it. We printed it at cost and you could buy 10 for £10 so that people could give them away. And that's always been the principle at Hope Together Mm. and LICC and Bible Society who co-published it with us were happy for that so that people could give it away. Mm. And it's been the same with Our Faithful Queen. It's a book that you can buy in bulk for about £2 a copy and you can give it away. Mm And yes, 1.6 million of those. And then uh, Our Faithful Queen, so far, 350,000 of wow. those. And it's still it's still in print, whereas our serv- the Servant Queen is, is out of print at the moment. But wow. we may well republish it because it's the only book the Queen ever wrote a forward for. Yeah, amazing. You must be you must be um, very pleased with how God has has used this as um, as a way of um, not merely uh, putting the queen in the limelight, but uh, putting the king that she serves in in that limelight that that he deserves. What what is what is your hope now, whether for these um, resources or whether for a nation that is mourning, a nation that is forced to confront its own mortality and forced to confront an uncertain future. Um, what do you think? What do you think the Queen would have us uh, think and expect in the future? Well, the Queen was someone who was really humble, and I think she would want us to think more about Jesus than about her, mm. and would want His name to be raised. Mm. So my hope is that the books will be used by people to give away and to talk. To start a conversation, really. Um, my my writing has always been to point people to Jesus. I don't get royalties from any of these, by the way. Um, and so I'd be keen for people to buy copies, have a conversation with a friend about what were the values. We've, we The Queen is so admired, but what were the values? What was the source of her her inspiration what why was it that she was the person that she was so i'd hope that people would visit the hope together shop and and buy books and give them away brilliant well they are wonderful lovely resources they look fantastic on a coffee table and the content is just um so honoring not only of of uh, her majesty but uh most of all honoring of the king that she serves uh, catherine butcher thank you so much thank you